Alright, so we're here for part three. Thank you for sticking with it so far. And so, take a look at what we've talked about. If we were to summarize the whole spiritual life, we could take this verse from Matthew chapter 5. Being therefore perfect is also your heavenly Father is perfect. Remember, another word, another phrase for spiritual theology art of perfection. And we're growing in perfection. It's not easy, but it's possible. And so, remember that as we grow in our own perfection, there's different stages. And that first stage is the perfect. And then the second stage is the elite. So, the perfect is, um, what, are, what are some characteristics that we remember from the perfect stage? Avoiding sin. But a little bit more than avoiding sin, also to have a disposition of penance. And so when we're penitent, that it's not just, for example, going to confession to the grocery list of sin. You have to actually be sorry for that grocery list, and so it's on there. And so there's another word that starts with the M that's related to penance to help us not fall back into sin. Mortification. Thank you. Back in the days of your shirts and all that, but you can still buy online, by the way. Uh, but anyway, and so there's an act of purgation. It's not pleasant. It's a death to sin, a death to self. But there's more to it in the spiritual life than just not sinning. And also in the purgative way, we're going to see what Tank Ray says are the first two grades of prayer: vocal and meditative. Gary the Grand places a little bit more. Some theologians are different. The illuminative way, what do we remember? What are some characteristics about that? So we have the four cardinal and the three theological. Okay, so virtue is something that makes it better. Now the moral virtues, that's something any human being can acquire. That's just by virtue of being human. And so even if you live all four of those out to the best of your ability, you could be the noble savage that St. Thomas talks about. It's not salvific, though. So we do need sanctified grace. Once we're baptized, sanctified grace is in our souls. And there's three theological virtues we get at our baptism. What, what are they? Faith, hope, and charity. Very good. So faith is dealing with um, raising the mind up to God, sense of knowledge. Hope is our will reaching up to God, and charity is dealing with the whole soul in union with God. Now, charity is the greatest of all virtues, and you can see a connection that charity has with the rest of the virtues. And what Gary does is that each of the stages has a greater degree of charity. So the first degree of charity, purgative, second degree of charity, illuminative, third degree of charity, unitive. And so, there's just a little bit more from the illuminative, just a small part we didn't get to last week. And so we talked about the moral and the theological virtues, big emphasis there. The illuminative way is big in following Jesus, leading out these virtues. However, just because we've been doing a lot of penance and mortification doesn't mean that the enemy's going to strike back. And so we do have to watch out for um, the seven capital sins coming back. If we do fall back on those, we have an attitude of what's called lukewarmness. And so, what happens is that if these seven capital sins are reawakened, we do see um, an ink, uh, they do awaken sins regarding pride, sensuality, and avarice. So some examples. So with pride, would be basically be saying, well, I'm not that bad, I don't have to really do anything. You're basically satisfied with where you are. Uh, instead of wanting to grow in the spiritual life, you're telling everyone else they need to grow in the spiritual life, so I'm feeling very hypocritical right now even saying that, so i got to work on what I'm doing myself. And so you don't want to fall into that. Now, with the sensuality, that's dealing with uh, well, sexuality, food, uh, sloth. So with spiritual gluttony, just as someone can eat too much food, and that has bad health effects. If one is living on consolation alone, 
then that can have um, bad effects too. That's why I always tell people just part of growing up is we like you're not always going to get affirmations. It doesn't necessarily mean you did something bad, it just means not everyone's going to compliment you 24-7 and you have to be okay with that. And so in the spiritual life, you have to learn how to let go. Not everything is going to be consolation. They do happen great. If not, it looks just part of life. Uh, other thing too is that we don't want to force um, any type of spiritual affection. The affections happen when we meditate, but you don't want to force it. So this is what I'm really big with people growing in the spiritual life. If, you know, we don't have a you know a crazy you know cry moment and prayer that that's okay. That those happen, great. If not, that's okay too. And so we don't rely on the consolation alone. We grow. Um, in spiritual lust, this actually is really good for boundaries, just with friendships. If the friendship's not help, helping you grow in holiness, just set boundaries. And then with sloth, desire as it sounds, basically one is growing in such a laziness that they don't want to do any form of piety anymore. And then avarice, this one I found interesting, even though I think Tank Ray was quoting John of the Cross, the people that were reading too much from spiritual reading to the point that they weren't really praying or they were buying so many religious objects that they forgot why they even bought them or bragging about the most expensive religious object that the spiritual reading and the, spiritual, the religious objects are supposed to bring you closer to God and so I'd say too I love spiritual reading but an example in the 21st century if you're like me and you're binging you know, the Father Ripper videos on YouTube um, well, you know, that's great, but pray. And actually, don't let this take away from your mental prayer. If you're, if you're spending all your time on YouTube watching videos, that's my, yeah, that's my, that's my predominant fault, so please forgive me. Um, but you got to make sure we have time for mental prayer, or why are we even reading all this stuff to begin with? Alright, so... With lukewarmness, there's a famous part in Revelation to the church in Las Laodicea that um, basically the Lord says, I know your works are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It's a very powerful language about those that fall into the lukewarmness. And so essentially it's a laziness. There's no will to do anything pious, and that, that sense of horror we have for sin just isn't there. In fact, what we're scared of is working hard. We don't want to work hard. So, if we do fall into the loop more, um, what can cause that is effective spiritual nourishment. So just as we're not getting healthy food into our bodies, we grow weak or sluggish. If we're not having a prayer life, we just grow complacent. Well, I guess I'm okay where I'm at. I'm not sinning, I'm not doing anything bad. That's like saying I'm an American citizen and I'm not in jail. Okay, okay. You can donate blood. You can vote. You could adopt a highway. Um, I mean, you could you could say hello to your neighbor. That there's plenty of ways to be a, even a better citizen. And the same thing is with Christianity. There's a much better way to grow in spiritual life than just not sinning. I mean, there's plenty of atheists that besides sin of atheism, you might be doing nice things. You can be do better. And then Tancre uses the language of a germ. And so think about how cancer can spread. It's very deadly. We don't want the lukewarmness to spread. It eventually throws us back into uh, earlier stages of the spiritual life. All right. Any questions on the illuminative before we go to the unitive? All right. So the unitive way. So, you know, the purgative way, the whole end goal, no more mortal sin, get rid of that. We want to have that union with God. We've got to get rid of all the bad stuff. The end goal for the luminative way, follow Jesus Christ with the virtues. And then the end purpose of the unitive way is none other than habitual and intimate union with God through Jesus Christ. This is more of a permanent, stable union. And so some of the characteristics we're going to see is a continual presence with God, um, a desire to contemplate Him all the time, you're thinking about God 24-7, and so you're, you're going to see a lot of love language leading up to the spiritual marriage uh, and greater prayer. And so, really the love of God becomes the only virtue of the soul. And you'll see that the virtues are 
everything else is connected to that. You're going to see a simplified prayer. Simple doesn't mean basic or dumb. Simple means it can't be broken down any further. And so what we're going to see as we look, build up to the ninth grade of prayer, that there's less of you talking and less of your body, less of your senses, and just more focus on God. That it gets extremely, extremely simple and basic. And so it's a very beautiful gaze. So we go from throwing a lot of stuff at God to just listening. So it's, it's very interesting how that happens. And really, that's not just a simplification of prayer. Our whole lives become simple. We focus on what we need. God, period. All right. Who belongs to the unit of will? Should be everyone. But, you know, some of the characteristics you'll see with people who have reached this level, it's like St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, is a great purity of heart, sense of self-mastery or self-control, and people that are thinking about God 24-7. Now, when we use the word contemplation in a broad sense, and this is something too, I'm old school, I like scholasticism, neo-scholasticism, there's a lot of distinctions, and so when we take a look at words, there's different senses. There's a broad sense, and a medium sense, and a narrower sense. It's good to get an idea of what all these different senses are, and I think a lot of arguments could be prevented if people knew what sense people were using. So in the broad sense, contemplation means you're admiring an object. It could be that fancy car. It could be a mountain. It could be a work of art. Okay. And so that's more of a natural contemplation. Okay. Now, a supernatural contemplation is looking admirably at God. And so when we talk about contemplative prayer, um, we're talking, this is what falls under supernatural contemplation. You're not going to pray um, looking at some other object not, uh, that's, that's not God. Now, there's also a very important distinction between acquired or active contemplation and infused or passive contemplation. Remember, acquired, that's something that we do. The infused, that's something we get. That's a gift. So, the acquired contemplation, this deals with the fourth grade of prayer, also known as the prayer of simplicity. We're going to go through the nine levels again later on in the talk. Um, so, the fourth grade of prayer is uh, simplicity. It's also called active contemplation. And so, it's contemplation which is the simplification of our intellectual, so basically our reasoning and effective feelings, but the result of our own activity aided by grace. So we're purposely kind of less reasoning um, and more focused feelings. Um, and that, while grace helps us, we're still the ones in control. Now the infused, this is what we received. So it's a contemplation in which the acts of the mind and the will become simplified under the influence of a special grace which takes hold of us and causes us to receive lights and affections God produces in us with our consent. So at this point, um, that'll be um, uh, contemplative prayer in the true sense when we get to, to uh, level five level of prayer. And so somewhere in between level four and five is a mixed contemplation, active and passive. And what we'll see is with the level four prayer simplification and level five is contemplative, that level four is very important. It's a hinge level of prayer. It's how we go from aestheticism to mysticism. Or we say we go from active to infusion. It's a very important level. And so, some other ways that we see this distinction between active and acquired. Um, Tankeray divides it up as what's called the active unit of way, then the passive unit of way. If anyone still has their chart from the Gary Gary Grange book, The Three Ages of the um, Interior Life, there's a couple of titles. He puts the nine grades of prayer differently than Tanqueray does. And so he puts more in, in the first stage, the purgative, uh, a little bit of the illuminative, and then really saves the last three stages for the unitive stage. With Tanqueray, he's a little bit different that he only puts um, the first two, vocal and meditative, and the purgative, he puts the effective level, that's the third grade prayer, and the illuminative, 
And then you put stages four through nine in the curative, or excuse me, the unit. So remember, theology is a science. Some people are going to look at this differently. Of course, the end goal is the same, a deeper union with God. And so with the simple act of unitive way, uh, we do see fervent souls eventually living in intimate union with God. They're living out those theological moral virtues. We've seen in the second stage. And they want to perfect them. And so when we talk about the theological and moral virtues, it's not, remember, if one is going to be in the purgative way, it means that they're, they're, they eventually want to live in union with God. They eventually want to live in a state of grace. You know, he uses the big W word, worldly. If you're not living in a state of grace, you're worldly. There's some other archaic insults in this book, too, that, so it's very interesting uh, to read. But anyway, uh, we have to live in a state of grace. And so these virtues, well, there's a focus on the limitative way, there's a lesser presence of them in the purgative, and there's even a more perfect version of them in the unitive. And so these moral virtues um, are perfected, and they get perfected by the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And so we'll, we'll get to that. When we get to the mystic or passive unitive way, this is going to deal with the um, infused contemplation, so levels 5 through 9 in prayer. And this is a simple, loving, protracted gaze on God and things divine. Under the influence of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and His special grace which takes possession of us. And so with infused contemplation, that Tanqueray uses it, basically um, with, with contemplative prayer up to level 9 of transforming you. The soul is slowly and slowly being possessed by God. And so we think of possession and all the exorcism of the head, movies and stuff, and someone likes to call the rectory, usually after those movies. But anyway, that we can also, our soul, be possessed by God. And it's God, and it's more of our interior senses being taken up, or our exterior senses taken up, even out of our memory or imagination, up to the point where everything is taken up. And so it's a very, very beautiful way of getting up to that spiritual marriage. Okay. Now, gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now, some people might have asked me before why I used the word Holy Ghost. One, it's in the book, but two, um, when we talk about the word spirit, there's different senses of the word spirit. And so, yes, I use Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost interchangeably. I use it in sacred liturgy in English when it says to use spirit, but it, if I have an option with the homily, I'll, I'll use ghost. That's because the ghost is more personal. You're talking about a person. Uh, unfortunately, in English, it does have a negative connotation sometimes or something spooky. Now, in using the word spirit, so yes, it can be used to talk about the third person in the Trinity. Spirit, you have school spirit, you have team spirit, uh, you even have a liquid form of spirits. And so there's different senses. And so with a ghost, it's more personal, you're talking about a person. And so, that's why I like to use it. Some people don't. Yes? So, that name, ghost versus spirit, doesn't correlate at all to the positive versus chapters. That's the right word. It's like, I don't know, like, ghost. Well, I mean, that'd be, is that true? I mean, it would be interchangeable. I mean, still, Well, I guess those that aren't Catholic would have been using Holy Spirit. You know, it, it also depends on, too, what vernacular language you're using. So I would have said that would have been more of just a, more of a practice than, I mean, it's more of a theological quibble at this point. But anyway, so there's seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. So we got wisdom, understanding, knowledge, Fortitude, counsel, piety, and fear of the Lord. Okay, so these gifts are supernatural habits. And so um, there's a docility to our faculties, prompted by the inspiration of grace. So it gives us an openness further toward, toward God. And now, 
thinking that at, at baptism we get the three theological virtues. So faith, hope, and charity are infused into our soul. We also get the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, and of course those gifts are strengthened at confirmation um, as well. Now, with the virtues, those are, you know, and it says energies are primarily active. While those virtues are given to us, God leaves it up to us. So really it's on us to use the virtues. Where the gifts is God taking the initiative. So think about it, virtues is something, well yes, we both perceive the theological virtues and gifts of the Holy Ghost. Virtues are something we do, gifts are something God gives us. Now the gifts help perfect those virtues. Now, where exactly do we cultivate these gifts? Okay, we're seeing at the same time the state of grace, so that would baptism. And, and so, how we cultivate a greater degree, practicing the moral virtues, that just because you receive faith, hope, and charity doesn't mean the natural virtues go away. Combating the spirit of the world, remembering we're holy, set apart, to your recollection, taking time to figure out what's going on here, uh, into your life, and to follow the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, if God's calling you, um, let's say God's starting to guard you know, for me to be a priest, and I'll just say, no, go away. Um, at the same time, if someone knocks in my office and said, Father, the Holy Spirit said we want to build a red robin next door or something, well, I might be tempted um, that the Holy <laughs> that there's also a discernment with the church and superiors. And so that's a distinction that, or a little caveat that Tankery adds in there, that yes, you listen to the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is also God and knows what he's doing. And so, I, just, I like that. Tankery also taught at my seminary about 100 years before I, I was there. All right. Uh, St. Mary's in Baltimore. And so he, he's, some of his, Comments about Father Bollier, who's the founder for the Sulpicians. I just brought back a lot of memories from seminary. And I, I, I really like his works. He died in the 1930s, so I don't think he taught at the newer seminary where I went, but you know, he's a good guy to read. All right, now how do we classify those virtues? And so, in regarding perfection, well, fear of the Lord is the least perfect, wisdom the most perfect. Regarding faculties, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, counsel, deal with the mind, piety, strength, and fear of the Lord, deal with the will. And so these gifts perfect the virtues. Um, an example, I'm not going to draw them, but an example would be that the gift of counsel perfects prudence, so that application of wisdom. So going through these gifts, how exactly, do, what are they, how do they help us? So, counsel perfects the virtue of prudence, making us judge promptly and rightly. And so it's sort of a supernatural intuition. And so it's, while we want to have prudence, we want to have a formed conscience and figuring out what to do, this is kind of your, your lifeline, figuring out what to do in a sticky situation. So it is a gift that helps you make that right decision when you might not know what to do at the right time. So, having uh, the way we cultivate that is having a deep sense of our weakness. And so making sure we're examining our confidence. Really, the times we mess up. Um, and then, two, listening to the voice of the Holy Ghost. That the Holy Ghost does prompt us. That the Holy Ghost is the soul of the church. And so it's very much alive and active. Next gift is piety. And so this begins in our hearts a filial affection for God and a tender devotion towards those persons and things consecrated to him in order to make us fulfill our religious duties with holy joy. And so, piety, um, there's a relationship to justice and religion. Remember, justice is giving to someone what they're due. Religion is related to justice, that religion is rendering right worship to God. So ultimately, that's for God. I mean, um, people that are not Christian have a virtue of religion by virtue being a human being, and it doesn't mean it's the best example of that virtue. It ultimately needs to lead to God. Now, having the gift of piety does help us fill out our religious duties based on our state in life, it helps us be respectful to our superiors, 
And the way to cultivate that is reading through the scriptures, meditate on the scriptures. And when it says transform ordinary actions and acts of religion, it means for your whole life to be a prayer. Prayer is just this one thing you do, that your whole life is a prayer. Your whole life is a communication with God. Now, fortitude. So, there might be a confusion. Wait, there's a virtue, a moral virtue called fortitude, and then there's this gift of the Holy Ghost called fortitude. And so, they differ because uh, the difference between the virtue of fortitude is that it is not the outcome of our efforts, the action of the Holy Ghost. So remember, virtues, that's something we do. Gifts, that's something God does. So, the, the gift of fortitude from the Holy Ghost we give the credit to, to God. We give it to Him. But it does allow us to be courageous. It does allow us to be heroic in times when people might be calling us into sinful behavior. And so, um, you know, we need God to be our strength. It's not easy to be a Christian. It does mean you have to build up our spiritual muscles and ethics get in this crazy world. Now, the gift of fear. So this is in a sense of, you know, walking on eggshells that this one's out to get me. But with the sphere, some, sometimes it's called awe, A W E. But it prevents you from getting a little bit too casual with God. That yes, God, you have a friendship with God, but it's not like, hey, God, what's up? What's going on? You know, let's, let's grab a few beers after work. You know, it's like, I mean, yes, the love God, but you can't get that casual with Him. I mean, you're, but he, he's in charge of your where you go at the end of this life, I mean, you know, probably want to behave a little bit. And so the gift of fear puts it in right perspective, making sure that we do have the right respect uh, for God and, that, and not have excessive familiarity with Him. So knowledge. So it's gift by illuminating action of the Holy Ghost, perfects the virtue of faith, and thereby gives us a knowledge of created things and their relations to God. And so, um, this gift of knowledge, it, it helps us essentially realize that everything comes from God, but it also helps us detach from creatures, making right use of them. Now, I know there's probably, there are a lot of animals here today, St. Francis, blessing, okay. Yes, there are creatures, but this is a creature, this is a creature, um, waters are created, and, and things that are created. You know, God's the creator, everything else is so we want to make sure that we're using the things of this earth for the right reasons. And that we have a healthy detachment. Not that, you know, these things are necessarily bad, but that we don't make an idol out of them. We leave room for God and realize that it all comes from God. And so if we have the eyes of faith, we see the connection that it all has with God. Now with understanding, it's a gift which under the enlightening action of the Holy Ghost gives us a deep insight into the revealed truths without however giving a comprehension of the mysteries themselves. And so, um, essentially, it does allow us to come to you know, a greater number of truths. Um, it allows us to see how these things all relate to God. Um, I think I'd use the image of, you know, incarnation. Well, why did the incarnation happen? Well, because we needed a Savior. Why did we need a Savior? Because the fall happened. And so it's a way to help you trace the steps back, ultimately to get to God, trace all these truths back to God to their source. And so that's what it means by going to the heart of the mystery. How do all these truths relate to God? Now wisdom, the skip perfects the virtue of charity by enabling us to discern God and divine things and their ultimate principles by giving us a relic for them. And so ultimate principles, why do these things exist? Okay. Um, if we have this, this gift, it's going to perfect the other virtues. And while wisdom and understanding might seem synonymous, the difference is that wisdom is that's dealing with the mind and understanding dealing with the heart. And so understanding, while well, someone might have head knowledge, think of understanding more of an empathy sense. And so I understand someone, I understand what you're going through. And so we cultivate it, asking God for it, we beg for it, increase of it. You see that truth stem from God. And th this one I really like to Realize that all knowledge is vain that does not lead to love. Nobody likes a know-it-all. I don't like know-it-alls because apparently I have nothing to ever contribute to that person's life. Now, I might call them if I'm on a game show and I need help, 
But besides that, I really don't want to hang out with them. And so the reason I'm doing this talk, it's not just to know a whole bunch of knowledge, so I want to grow a deeper union with our Lord. I want to be able to use this knowledge for the rest of my priesthood. So it's not wasted time, it's not to brag about being a know-it-all. Um, but the whole idea is that it helps you grow in love with the Lord. It helps you bring other people into love with the Lord. And so whenever we're doing the faith formation, make sure we're doing it for the right reasons. And so not to fall into intellectual pride. And I just say that just because there's well, there's a lot of great resources online. We want to make sure that we're, we're looking at it for the right reasons. Um, that you know, we want this information uh, to help people grow in holiness. All right. So the gifts help with prayer and contemplation. So the gifts of the Holy Ghost dispose, dispose the soul, grant it more docile. So there's better openness to being led by the Holy Ghost, and they aid us in active contemplation. Um, so, loving gaze on truth, again, that's more on our end. And so, with these having attained the complete development, a part of wondrous docility to the soul, which now makes it fitting or open, so allows us to go from level four grade of prayer to level five, to go from simplicity to that infused contemplation. Now, this is a slight caveat. And so, sometimes when we're talking, when you read sacred scriptures, of seeing God, hearing God, uh, touch, taste, smell. When it's not of the senses, that these are referring, there's a connection to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that whenever you hear sight and hearing, it's dealing with understanding. And that with touch, taste, and smell, with, with wisdom. So next time you see those sense, sensory images, uh, make a connection to the Holy Ghost. Now, the fruits. And so, the big biblical image for this is from St. Paul to the Galatians. To be essentially a fruit of the Holy Ghost is an act of virtue which reaches a certain degree of perfection and fills the soul with hope and joy. So this is an act. So this is something we're doing, doing and it reaches a certain degree of perfection. And so, um, the gifts perfect the virtues and when those virtues are put in, those perfected virtues are put in action, there's fruit that can be reaped. And so we have charity, joy, peace, patience, dignity, goodness, longanimity, mildness, faith, modesty, constancy, and chastity. And so I think Thomas actually has a few more than this, but this is kind of a, I think it's a little bit debatable how many number of fruits there are, but you can't go wrong with St. Paul. So this is true, there might be a little bit more depending on what you look at. All right, now how do the gifts and the Beatitudes relate to each other? Well, the Beatitudes are fruits of such mature perfection, they already furnished with us a foretaste of heavenly happiness. So what's another word for Beatitude? Okay, I'm blank and I know it, clap your hands. Happy, very good. All right, so Beatitudes are dealing with a happiness. First, there's a natural happiness in this life, that's great, it's not so different. We need eternal Beatitude. So the Beatitudes here that Christ talked about is helping us pave the way to lead a life for that. Now, before talking about the different grades of prayer, now, just for review, you have vocal prayer. So that could be something private, everything from God, I love you, to um, what happens in the sacred liturgy. So standing up and reciting the creed of everyone on Sunday. Those are all vocal prayers. Now, discursive meditation, Discursive means a reasoning. And so there are different meditations out there. Father Olie, the Sulpicians have one. Uh, St. Ignatius has one. The Carmelites have one. But there's a formula for it. And so I suggest taking a look at it. If you're looking for more structure, really focus on level two. What are some meditations? In the, in the pre, uh, pre-meditate, what am I going to think about today? Am I going to meditate on the resurrection? hope on this virtue, on this passage, that have a plan. And so, if you're interested, I'd recommend buying the Tanqueray book, because he goes through those different forms. Actually, you could buy Jordan Allen's Spiritual Theology. It's a little bit easier to read. And he has those same formulas, too, about what a meditation is. Now, from those meditations, our feelings um, can can get involved in our pious sentiments. So we have affective prayer. 
And so those feelings come out of our reasoning. And so what you'll see is um, Tanqueray places level one and two in the purgative stage. Level three, he places in the illuminative stage. And then levels four through nine, he puts in the unitive stage. So Gary Gilbride just something a little bit different. Again, theology is a science. Some people differ. And so simplicity is dealing with, so with affective, our highest sentiments come out of our reasoning. You might have multiple affections. Love, this, that. And it seems like a little sporadic. That the simplicity helps hone those affections in. And let's, how about we just deal with one affection? And you meditate on that. So that's what we get with simplicity, is honing in those affections. Let's just deal with one. Okay. Now, at this point, level four is a hinge between the aesthetic and the mystical, between the active and the infusion. And so, some people will call level four active contemplation, or acquired contemplation. Level five is infused contemplative, so this is where we're receiving something. At this point, it really is a gift, and you don't force it. And so, level four is the contemplative, and as we go from, really, one through nine is a big, one giant simplification. But as we move more and more up the grades of prayer, it really does get more and more simple. And it's not always easy. There's going to be joyful moments. There's going to be extremely painful, excruciating moments. But that's what it takes to have that spiritual marriage, transforming union. Okay, so prayer simplicity. Um, Jacques Rousseau defines this level of prayer as a simple loving gaze on some divine object. So, again, this is something we do, active, it's required, um, it's a simple um, gaze. So, um, we're not necessarily having all the reasoning going up in our mind, and so and it's not just a bunch of sporadic affections, it is something more focused. And so we do see it as a bridge between the aesthetic and the mystical. And so, there is a suppression of reasoning, you're not just going to have all these thoughts going on in your head. There's one long affection. And it's not only your prayer life getting simplified, it's really your whole life is being simplified. What do I really need? And so the advantages of this prayer is it's greater than glory for God, and it, was, it helps your soul. You detach from things you don't need. Any humility. Hey, it's not all about me. It's about God. And so... Um, Go on. So this paves the way for infused contemplation prayer. So this is level five of prayers. And so this once again is a simple gaze, but now it's under the influence of the gifts of the Holy Ghost and of a special actual grace which takes possession of us. So from this point on, we're going to have deeper and deeper possession by God. This is good possession, not not, not scary but good possession. Good possession. So there's going to be less and less of our faculties that we're in control of and more of God in control. And so um, other thing to keep in mind is that we don't force this to happen. So levels one through four, there's still us involved, us being active with it, we're being guided by the Holy Ghost. Once we get to level five in prayer, it's up to God. So we don't force these contemplative moments. And so um, God is the one who determines it all. So again, we don't want to fall into the spiritual gluttony, relying on consolations alone. And so our soul is going to take a more of a passive role, like I've said. Um, and so at this point, too, I like this language, too, that in the soul, love is going to be greater than its knowledge. And so as much as we love... And I always loved the, the image of Thomas Aquinas toward the end of his life, that he was, he was frustrated, he was kind of his head resting on the tabernacle, frustrated, and, and basically has this mystical vision. Basically everything what he saw was so great that he said that everything he wrote was essentially straw. And he's one of the smartest men that ever lived. And so 
that we can have all this head knowledge would ask you to use for the right reasons. And so there's also going to be have some joy and sadness that occurs. And so while we're getting closer to that spiritual marriage, there is a sadness of saying, hey, I'm not in heaven yet. I'm not in heaven yet. I'm still on earth. I don't like earth anymore. And so this isn't someone who loves aliens. It's just someone who really wants to be in heaven. Um, and you're going to have some other characteristics of divine darkness. Essentially, this deals with the, um, with the negative um, reasoning, realize that it just leads you back to God. Um, and then also, there's an intense love of God there, too. And so, who's called the contemplation? Well, there is, what, what Tanqueray brings up, there are privileged souls, so certain, certain saints, like St. Teresa of Avila, okay, from infancy, I'm going to give you this gift. Now, it is open for everyone who has done the proper preparation of detachment, the practice of virtues, and mental and effective prayer. And so, when we switch from that active to infuse, from that discursive meditation to infuse contemplation. One, please, please, please talk to your spiritual director before trying this at home. And so, um, at this point, it basically be that someone had mastered the discursive meditation to such a level that they have no imagination, that they can't really fix on a particular object. And really, they just want to be alone. They want to have that just simple, all they want. That's all they're asking. And so for them, there can be kind of a pain of just wanting to have that. Um, so, which leads us up to the prayer of quiet. So this is level six of prayer. Um, it's a type of mystical prayer in which the intimate awareness of God's presence captivates the will and fills the soul and body with ineffable sweetness and delight. And so, so the soul will actually acquire an actual possession joyful fruit from the sovereign good. So keep in mind, the deeper we go in these prayers, the more our soul is possessed by God. Now, there's going to be a painful, a dry aridity to this quietude. Then there's going to be a sweetness to it. So we think of aridity, dryness. Okay. So, how many people are familiar with John the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul? Okay, a few people. Okay. That's also in my reading list, and so I couldn't talk about everything tonight. Now, a very strong connection to John of the Cross is that at this point in the nine grades of prayer, this is what John of the Cross calls the first night, dealing with the night of the senses. So keep in mind, there's already a lot of purgation that happened in the purgative, an act of purgation. I don't want to do mortal sin anymore. I want to do penance. I want to do all these mortifications. Okay. Well, if we're going to advance further toward that spiritual marriage, now there's another purgation, and this is a passive purgation. So this is actually, it's, it's like a gift, okay? And so we need to be thankful if we get to this level, uh, but it's going to be painful. And so there's an image that John of the Cross uses that Tanqueray brings up about this dryness. Why should I have to go through all this dryness I'm going to go through um, if I want to get closer to God? And he uses the imagery of firewood. Anyone who's tried to burn a firewood that is a recently, I mean, if you just cut down a live tree, it's going to be a lot harder to burn the wood. It's alive. But if it's dry in season, it's a lot easier to burn. And so that's, that the dryness has a purpose there. It's, it's preparing us. Now, it is going to be easy. Well, it's not easy, but with these trials, you're going to have temptations. You're going to have temptations to fall back on these mortal sins that we didn't want to commit anymore. You're going to have persecution from other people, even your own superiors, even other Catholics. are going to think you're crazy. And just read the lives of the saints. A lot of them never fit in. And so, and then also other evils too from, from the evil one. And so, if one is at level six prayer, um, you don't return to discursive meditation at this point. Now, how long do these trials last? Tanker is saying anywhere two to 16 years. It, it depends on God. So it's up to him. So don't blame me. All right. <laughs> All right. Now we get to the other part of why is sweetness. So at this point, um, in this prayer, the higher faculties of the soul, the intellect, and the will 
are seized by God and may enjoy very gentle repose and very deep joy in His presence. All right, so keep in mind that when we're in this, um, everything from the contemplative prayer level five to level nine, the souls being more and more possessed by God. So at this point, the intellect and the will are possessed. However, the memory and imagination are free. So you do, it is easy to fall into distractions. Now, with this intellect and the will um, being possessed, we do have this language of the sleep of the faculties. And so with that, one is able to be inebriated with love. And so in order to have this experience, um, we do have to go through the aridity that dryness quietly, that first night of the senses first. And so, um, in order to, one reach is in this quiet place, you do see an abandonment to God during this process. Now, to the seventh grade of prayer, this is called the prayer of full union. Sometimes we'll see it called simple union. And so it's a great mystical prayer in which all the internal faculties, to keep in mind, level six, it was the intellect and the will that possessed. And now, it's even the memory and imagination. So all the internal faculties are captivated and occupied with God. So what do we have left? The senses, external body senses. And so some of the characteristics you'll see, suspension of all the faculties, um, again, internal. Um, there is an absolute certitude of God's presence in the soul. That's good. No more distractions, so you won't be um, checking your email during your prayer life. Not that you should be doing that, but you won't be doing it anymore. Um, absence of fatigue, and you have this extraordinary abundance of joy. You're also going to see greater zeal to tap the preachers, um, perfect submission to God, and greater charity. Now, what I really like about this is that once you get to level seven, you do have these extraordinary phenomena or confident phenomena. And so, Alvin talks about this. Um, you have something called the mystical touch, which is essentially this sensation where you know God is just you, you've been touched by God and it's just um, he doesn't list any scene examples if I remember um, but, but it also while it generally happens in the stage I mean God's not bound by the nine stages of prayer I mean even, and if you wanted someone could experience that um, sensation um, but then you also have what I like the fiery darts of love I know this is something Padre Pio talked about essentially wounding in your heart. You feel the love of God. It's great. Then there's also this sorrow that you're not in heaven yet. And so there's this pain. You're not quite there. You're not quite there. Then when we get to level 8 in greater prayer, this is called the spiritual espousal. You're almost there with the marriage. You're not quite. And there's going to be a lot of darkness in this state before you get to that marriage. And so, in this state, it's called the prayer of conforming union. Therefore, the soul loses the use of its external senses. All right, so at this point, the intellect and the will are possessed, the imagination and memory are possessed, now your external senses are possessed. Either partially or totally, because all the interior faculties are absorbed in God. And so, this stage has two main parts. You have the sweet or ecstatic, and then the bitter. So this sweet ecstatic union, it, the main part is dealing with that absorption of God. Again, the eternal faculties have all been absorbed. Now your external sort of faculties are being absorbed. And there, it was actually an interesting reading this in Tanqueray, too, that some of the debates said, well, the saints were saying, well, if your external faculties and your internal faculties are absorbed, how do you have free will? And then Thomas said, you still do, so I'm going to trust him. I think that would be a whole other talk for another time, honestly. Um, but at this point, um, you do have a sense of ecstasy. So the simple ecstasy, this is essentially dealing with, you know, there's this profound pain. You're, you're, not, you're not quite there um, in that ninth level. You're not in you know, heaven, but you know you're close. There's a deep love of God, and there's pain that you're not quite there. The rapture, you know, this isn't to be confused with the Protestant belief of basically being 
Christ coming, the second come, the secret coming, and then there's a whole bunch of like clothes around, you know, where'd everyone go? That, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, the rapture, rapture and flight of the spirit are almost like their soul just kind of takes a flight <laughs> and gets a, a greater sense of who God is. But then there's a pain of you have to come back to your body. And so with that, you're going to see a greater sense of holiness and increase in virtues. Now, at this point, if there's been thoughts of, well, where do the, you know, things like levitation and, and stigmata, how, how do they relate to the spiritual world? Well, they fall in the unitive stage, but they also fall in this eighth grade of prayer, ecstatic union. So the saints who have experienced miracles, and God is not bound to the eighth grade of prayer, but generally speaking, this is the level that they get to. So levitation. For instance, St. Joseph of Cupertino, patron saint of aviators, he used to be so in love with God that he would just levitate. And I, I remember, right, some of his brothers basically had to tie a string to him and pull him down like he was a balloon. I'm like, all right, stop, Joe. Come on, come on down. Then this one, we well, might joke about people having halos. Well, it's a possibility, so you know, don't, you know, you don't have to be dead to have a halo. And so, Called luminous radiance. Now, fragrant odors, well, I think of this with the incorruptible saints, with their, with their deceased bodies, it can actually happen for living saints as well. So if someone says what perfume or cologne you're wearing, just say holiness. So, okay. uh, prolonged fasting, so some of the saints, like St. John of Vienne, he would just live on the Blessed Sacrament alone in a potato. So it's probably more Irish than I'll ever be. You know, he's French. And then stigma, so having the wounds of Christ. So Father Pio is one of the more recently famous saints who had it. Anything from the fire wounds to just the hands, that it just depends on what God wants to give someone. All right, so we've talked about the sweet ecstatic union. Now, right before we get to that spiritual marriage, this is the other night of the soul. This is dealing with the night of the spirit. And so this is very, very profound. And so this is the last bit of purgation someone would need to go through. And so any habitual, any imperfection is just blotted out at this point. So dealing with habitual imperfections. So, um, you know, some of these dealing with um, if there's any distractions of dullness of mind, no, we gotta get rid of that. Um, any sense of complacency, you know, we got to get rid of that too. Or any sense of reverent, if there was a loss of reverential fear. If you've been having all these ecstatic moments, and hey, I've been levitating, hey, I got God on speed dial, it's like, no, 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 he's God and you're not. And so we got to get rid of that excessive familiarity. So there has to be a reverential fear. So now we get into this other night, the night of the spirit. Remember, the other one is called night of the, of the senses. And so in order to purify and reform the soul, God leaves the mind in darkness, the will in aridity and dryness, the memory in forgetfulness, and the affections immersed in pain and anguish. And so looking at the mind, that Tancre uses language that the light of contemplation dazes the mind's eye, that it's too weak and too impure to behold. It's kind of like if you've been sitting in darkness and that you see this light and you're like, ah. It's, it's like that, but it's extremely painful. It also, it's suffering to the will. And so, at this point, I mean, you're so close to that spiritual marriage, um, you think that it's going to last forever. And even Tangeri uses language that the soul is thinking, oh, I, you know, this, this feels like hell. Um, even though it, we're not, it'd be hard to sink back out though at that point, but. Um, Really, what your soul is going through is, a, is an abandonment, a dereliction. Now, once you go through that painful night of the spirit, you do have good results. There's a greater love for God that you have this great sense of consolation, a greater sense of security, and to save uh, an excessive amount of time, I am not going to go through the ten stepping stones or ladder of divine love. So, Saint John of the Cross has a, a little more specificity getting up to that spiritual marriage. So we talk about 10 stepping stones. And 
when I got to that point in Tanqueray, I was like, what? There's, there's still more? Like, how? Oh, ah. And so anyway, it's, you know, stairway to have a reference right there, so 10 steps. All right. So now we're at the spiritual marriage, the ninth grade of prayer, transforming union. And so in this grade of prayer, there's a total transformation of the soul to the beloved. The soul is entered into its very center, so to speak, in which the throne room, the interior castle, where the Trinity dwells through grace. There God and the soul give themselves to each other in the consummation of divine love, so far as it is possible in the present life. So basically, this is the closest you can get to God as an earthly being. Okay, so you're going to see an intimacy with God. Everything's been purified. There's a serenity. You're going to be at peace. And there's also an adult in, in, indissolubility. So just like there's an indissolubility with marriage, the sacrament, there's an indissolubility with this once you get to this stage. Now, however, and there's debate between St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. So if one was to reach the transforming union, is it possible to fall back into sin, impeccability? St. John of the Cross says no. Once you're there, you've already been essentially perfected in grace. And then St. Teresa of Avila says, well, it's not that you would fall back into sin, but you know, I don't want to say for certain, and so the impeccability is still there. That would be an inter interesting theological debate. I, I, would, I would pay for view that. I would love to see that. All right. And so at this point, and then there's also to uh, an imaginative intellectual vision, a greater sense of what the Trinity is. Um, if I had more detail, I'd be just to, not that I've seen the beatific vision or the intellectual vision here, but know what the nuance is. It's like, what would, obviously the beatific vision is better. Um, would it be interesting just to see what is shared in that versus in the beatific? All right. Transforming union, um, the effects, there's holy abandonment in the hands of God. Um, suffering isn't going to mean so much to you anymore that at this point, you're married, you know, your soul's married to God. Um, you can, you just, you know, nothing's going to hurt you at this point. Um, and then the ecstasy stops, and so you don't really need it at that point. And so you have that spiritual marriage with God. And so, just to summarize the unitive way we've talked about grades, really level four through nine with the, with the prayers, Tanqueray says, God gradually takes possession of the whole soul in contemplation. First, he seizes the will in prayer quietly, that's level six. He lays hold of the interior faculties in the prayer full union, level seven. He takes possession of both the interior faculties and exterior senses, ecstasy, level eight. And finally, in spiritual marriage, number nine, he binds the whole soul to himself in an abiding union. All right, so that's my talk. Now, if we were gonna have summarize this in one sentence, how would we do it? All right, B. Perfect, therefore, the heavenly father is perfect. So that was a long way of saying this one sentence. All right. Any questions? Yes. So if we don't do this in this life, are we expecting to do it in purgatory? Yes. <laughs> so yes. do it here, and you're mm -hmm. so far on the game. Right, it's like taking you know, AP courses in high school before you get to college. <laughs> So it's, at the same time, we don't want to have a, if we're not striving for deeper union, then we're, then we're, we're going backwards in the spiritual life. It's, we have to want to grow a deeper union. And so I'd rather go through the purgation now than in the afterlife. Other questions? Yeah. Sure. You know, that, that's something too I was thinking about I was putting this together is I could wager that a lot of people are in the well, there's a lot of worldlings and lost souls, but for those in a state of grace who want to grow in union, I think a lot of people are floating around in the purgative, is getting rid of those bad habits and vices. I think what'll help 
is that level two greater prayer meditation. And I think, you know, I pray the rosary every day. I have a sticker on my truck, so do it. Go to Mass, do liturgy the hours. But I think that meditation helps. And so having a formula, what am I going to pray about today? And so whether I'm using the Sultitian model, the Ignatian model, Armite model, Dominican, whatever, I think if we have that structure in our life, then that will lead to the affections. And now I have all these affections. What am I going to do with them? Simplify them. So my suggestion for advancing would be to do these meditations. And so uh, buy this book. I don't get any royalties, but you know, just have a sense of you know, what different formulas to go through. And so I think that that'll help. And so reading about the unit of ways, just, am I ever going to get here? And you also, too, think about it, too, that a lot of these people I threw out were religious, that they didn't have families or anything, but that doesn't mean that someone who has a family can't reach that kind of stage. And so, you know, easy, easy, easier said than done, but, you know, if we're not striving for it, then we're, um, then we're, not, then we're not growing and actually making things worse or be lukewarm. Other comments, thoughts, questions? Alrighty, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm going to be doing a retreat on this out in Abingdon. I was in Bristol in my past one year, so I'm going to do some editing and try to put this together in a more of a retreat form. But thank you for being my first audience. Uh, this is a uh, uh, really good experience. It helps me in my spiritual life, too. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Someone had asked me before about the possible of getting this back and introducing some of the slides. Sure. So if anyone would like a copy of the slides, please send me an email. So it should be on the website, jorreillyrichmonddiocese.org. So I can give you a copy of it. All right. So let's end with Our Father and Tell Mary. Call it a night. Call our son. Then, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our